The 1946 March of Dimes presents a special program with Basil O'Connor, president of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, and featuring the famous screen star Jimmy Stewart. Both men have served their country well. Mr. Stewart has just completed his wartime duties with the United States Army Air Force. Basil O'Connor, for many years, has carried on the great humanitarian fight to protect America's children from infantile paralysis. And here he is, welcoming our Hollywood guest into the ranks of the 1946 March of Dimes, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Wright. First, I want to greet you, our listeners, in the name of your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. You've all been its good friends from the day it was founded by our late beloved President Franklin D. Roosevelt. I want to thank you for making possible its far-flung work by your generous participation in the annual March of Dimes. Because of you, year after year, thousands of infantile paralysis victims in this country have been given proper care and treatment and so spared to live a happy, useful life. These victims came from cities, villages, and isolated farms. They were often very poor. They were of every race and creed and color, and of every age, too. But most of them were little children. That's why the March of Dimes can be called primarily a crusade to ensure the future of young America. That's why you are so unfailingly generous year after year because young America deserves everything in the world we can do for it. We're proud of our children here, and we have good reason to be. Other people sometimes tell us that we pamper our children too much. We are said to make them disobedient and disrespectful by allowing them to think and act for themselves in small affairs. Or we're said to neglect their culture by letting them play in their spare time instead of studying. Well, I think what we gain from our system is much more than we lose. We've just seen young America grow up and take part in the large affairs of the world and give a tremendously fine account of itself. And the reason for that is that our boys and girls have never been regimented. They can think and act for themselves, having learned to do this in their childhood. Above all, their spirit is free, their bodies healthy. Our mild form of discipline does them no harm. Their playtime out in the sunlight isn't wasted. Young America can do the job it is given wherever it goes, can perform its full share in winning bravely a long and terrible war. People who do their share in winning wars are often referred to as heroes. But call the young American a hero and see where you get. He won't like that. He'll be angry and embarrassed and quite sure it isn't true. No matter how many decorations he wears when he comes home, he doesn't act like a hero, and as far as he's concerned, he doesn't feel like one. Not him. He's Yankee Doodle, who sticks a feather in his cap and calls it macaroni, instead of chivalry's white plume. He's early Uncle Sam, tall and on the lanky side, with careless clothes and a lock of hair strayed down across his forehead. He ambles instead of struts, and he faces death and other serious moments with a wisecrack. That's our young American, the boy from everybody's house, no matter what house he actually comes from. He won't let us call him a hero, so we won't. He won't let us tell him we love him either, but we do. It therefore seems to me supremely fitting that the person who is now going to talk to you about the 1946 March of Dimes crusade for young America is someone enshrined in millions of hearts as the typical young American. You've seen him on the screen many times in the past, tall and on the lanky side, brave but shy, always getting things done and never fussing about it, always one of us. He's been away for a while, but there are very good reasons why you haven't forgotten him. We're happy to have him back. In introducing him to you, I could say, ladies and gentlemen, I am proud to present that eminent motion picture star, Mr. James Stewart. But because of what he means to us, I'm just going to say to you, friends, here's Jimmy Stewart. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here on behalf of some people who are getting up a parade. It's the biggest parade in the world. It lasts for two weeks without stopping. The line of march extends from coast to coast and from the border of Canada to the border of Mexico. 
And there are more marchers in it than there are people in the United States. Yes, sir, that's right. I kind of think it sounds a little crazy in myself, but it's true. You see, the marchers aren't people. They're dimes. Little silver ten-cent pieces out of men's pockets, women's handbags, children's piggy banks. Millions on millions of them joined up in this parade. It's the annual March of Dimes sponsored by your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. And it isn't only the biggest parade in the world, it's the best, because it does the most good. I've got figures on that to prove it to you. But I won't start out by telling you that there were 13,000 infantile paralysis victims here in this country in 1945, and it was the fourth worst epidemic in the recorded history of the disease. I'll just begin by talking about a kid. A kid, well, a kid likes to play and whoop and holler and make a nuisance out of himself banging around the house. When his folks want him downstairs, he's upstairs. When they want him in, he's out throwing a ball through somebody's window or something. And his folks get mad, you know. What wouldn't they give to be able to keep him still for a whole afternoon? And then there comes an afternoon when he is still. Yeah. Yeah, it was all right yesterday, but this morning he couldn't get out of bed. The doctor said it was infantile paralysis. And the kid's going to keep still for an awful long time. His folks maybe don't say anything now. Dad sits in the corner with paper unfolded, but he isn't reading the paper. Mom just cries where nobody can see her. But they don't have to say what they'd give if the kid was up again, playing and whooping and hollering. They'd give all the money they had, their house and their car and their lives thrown in. Only it's too late. Well, now I've said that, I'll tell you the rest of it. That kid didn't live in a house in 1945. He lived in more than 13,000 houses. He was more than 13,000 kids. None of them different until this thing happened. He was city kids and country kids, rich kids, poor kids, big kids, little kids. Your National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis doesn't care who or what or where a kid is. If he's in danger of death or being crippled for life and his folks need to call for help, your National Foundation will be at his side. In almost any case, you know, they need to, because infantile paralysis costs such a lot. I've got figures on that, too, which I'll give to you in just a minute. And when I do, remember the kid. There for him. There for infantile paralysis. Now, it's a pretty bad financial problem to be sick anyhow for most people. President Truman has said this in his health message to Congress last November. He said... The principal reason why people do not receive the care they need is that they cannot afford to pay for it on an individual basis at the time they need it. This is true not only for needy persons. It is also true for a large proportion of normally self-supporting persons. They may be hit by sickness that calls for many times the average cost, in extreme cases for more than their annual income. When this happens, they may come face to face with economic disaster. Many families, fearful of expense, delay calling the doctor long beyond the time when medical care would do the most good. Yes, but you delay calling a doctor for a kid with infantile paralysis, and you're taking away the kid's one chance to grow up straight and useful and happy. You've got to get care for him quick, and go on getting care for him for a long time afterwards. And that's where my figures come in. Now, I'll skip the cost of doctors and nurses and ordinary hospitalization because you all probably know something about that. I'll come down to just one thing, the special appliances used in the treatment of infantile paralysis. Listen to what they cost. A swimming pool for $35,000. Now, that's not a Hollywood swimming pool, you understand. It's, it's a hospital or scientific institution. And if you could see the little kids in it, getting back their strength and the use of their limbs, you'd know it was cheap at the price. But alone, by yourself, well, maybe you wouldn't have the price. A respirator for $1,300. That's for patients with paralyzed lungs. They can't live without it. Somebody's got to provide it for them while they need it. But you, maybe, 
Maybe you couldn't do it by yourself. The equipment for physical therapy, such as an electric cabinet for $520, and a whirlpool bath for $385, and an ultraviolet ray machine for $200, a hot pack machine for $125, Oh, and there's some little stuff among the appliances, too. Stuff a lot easier on the pocketbook, like a leg brace for $40, a wheelchair for $35. But I wouldn't say those were any easier on the heart, especially if you knew that they mightn't have to be bought at all if the kid be could be cured by the big stuff. You've got to get him by the big stuff. And you say there isn't that much money in the world. Oh, sure there is. Here it comes across the country on parade, the March of Dimes. The millions on millions of little round ten-cent pieces jingling their music to march by, with dollars joining in because there's no law against it. Dimes and dollars pouring out of all the houses to give a future to all the victims of infantile paralysis. Five million dollars worth of them in 1945, spent for medical care and treatment for those victims, hit by the fourth greatest infantile paralysis epidemic. Here they come now in 1946. By January the 30th, the date which will always commemorate the birthday of Franklin D. Roosevelt, our great war president, there will be enough of them to support this tremendous work which he founded. There will be enough because you will open your doors and send your dimes and dollars out into the parade. Do it today, ladies and gentlemen. Join the March of Dimes and... Half of them will come marching back again and take care of your neighbor and your kid if there should be need this year. You have just heard a special program in behalf of the 1946 March of Dimes with Basil O'Connor, president of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and featuring Jimmy Stewart. Before we say goodbye, I'd like to repeat a few words spoken by Jimmy Stewart. They were... Join the March of Dimes, and half of your dimes and dollars will come marching back again to take care of your neighborhood and your kid. Let me explain that more fully. Half of your March of Dimes contribution does stay in your community. It enables your county chapter of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis to ensure immediate and competent medical care when infantile paralysis strikes your child. Such immediate hospital care and attention could help save his life or save him from living a lifetime on crutches. Prompt medical care is the key to victory in handling infantile paralysis cases. The other half of your contribution, ladies and gentlemen, goes to the national headquarters of your National Foundation for Epidemic Aid, for educational work, such as the training of nurses and physical therapists, and the dissemination of information to the medical and lay world about the disease. Also, to support scientific medical research, to find the cure and prevention of infantile paralysis. This latter phase of your National Foundation's work, to find the cure and prevention of the disease, is the organization's major goal. So you see, friends, every dime you give to the March of Dimes does an all-round job the year-round to protect your child. For his sake, for the sake of all children, send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters now. Join the March of Dimes.